All right, well, what we were working on is this RDR POS tagger. Now, last week when we were goofing around, I could not get the QDAP package to load. Um, I figure it out, right? So if you, when you're trying to work, trying to get the QDAP package to load and you get an Excel error, so you'll see something about XLSX doesn't load and it freaks out. That more than likely is an error with the XLSX package, which this calls, which I don't entirely why that's necessary. But what I had to do was uninstall that and reinstall it. And you may have to install the XLSX one, it's hard to say, from GitHub. So if you run into that error message, you let me know and I have the solution. Because um, I know at the end of last week's class, I was like, dang it, why isn't this working? But that's what it was. It is related to R Java, but it wasn't the problem. It was the fact that the XLSX package was not calling Java correctly. And then QDAP calls that one. So we had this like chain of problems. <laughs> so QDAP called the XLSX package and which then got confused on where Java was. So I think it's a, uh, I updated all of my packages at the start of the semester, which I always try to do. Um, and I think it had the bug in that version and I had to install a version from GitHub that had been open, had been updated to not have that bug is essentially, I think, what it ended up being. But yeah, if you can't get our Java to load, none of these will load. They're pretty much required, but my R Java is working. Okay, so that's the update from the last class. I got it to work after class. Okay, so we finished. Um, talking about QDAP and its tags, and then we're going to move on to RDR POS tagger. <clears throat> and really, there was a big focus, or our, our focus here was on the word fire. So we're going to come back to that, and um, what we'll see is that pretty much none of the part of speech taggers that we are going to use really get fire quite correct in the fact that we have such a complicated clause. So remember that sentence was very complex. We would not, nor would we could not, nor would we fire professor person, blah, 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 blah. And we were looking at that specifically at that embedded clause with the word fire that caused us issues. Okay. Um, so what is an RDR tagger? Well, it's called a ripple down rules, part of speech tagger. This is what I would say is a, a lot of state of the art, or R anyway, um, is a ripple down rules tagger. And what it does, is um, takes a lot of the rules that we're gonna show you how to write on your own and implements them in a ripple down fashion. So um, it has these like back off um, settings that allow you, well, if this part doesn't get it, is it, doesn't know the answer, then try this other thing. And if that one doesn't know the answer, try this other thing. Just a lot of um, if else kinds of statements. And it's based on this corpus that's from Universal Dependencies. And it's meant to be the sort of like systematic way to think about tagging across languages. Because one of the biggest issues that you'll, hopefully you'll kind of get as we go, is that mo a lot of this work is very isolated to one language or another. And doesn't capture really the connections between languages because for a long time, the corpora were really available in English, and that was it. Um, but then now, even as we grow and we gain, we get more and more resources, um, what you see is that the, the dominant work is still in English. So this uh, kind of system allows us to start thinking about cross-linguistic stuff. So it has a bunch of um, languages that you can look at their corpora, and download some of their stuff, um, which is one of the most well-represented systems. So one, the reason I wanted to talk about this one was because um, it has the most languages tagging-wise possible built in. Okay. So what you can do is use um, the function RDR available models just to see which language uh, options are available. Now, Universal Dependencies website has more than the 
package currently has. But I think they're doing better than a lot of other people. So you can do part of speech tagging with lots of features. So parts, lots of parts of speech. Um, kind of like how we looked at the pen tree bank has like 50 some odd tags. This one here um, implies that these have very granular tabs. So there's a lot of um, detail available in um, what is interestingly not all Indo-European languages. So that's kind of cool, right? Um, you can also add morphological tags. So this is um, separating cats and cat, um, separating walk and walked, that kind of thing. And then the best part is at least I could do the universal part of speech, uh, which remember is about 10 tags, the universal tag set in a bunch of languages It goes on. And so some of them are labeled funny, lassie, small. Okay. But they do have different types of English. Um, and so this to me is really nice because it also captures the different um, dialects or creoles that are available in some languages. Okay. So you don't always see that. <clears throat> so if you're going to do this in R, this is a great package. Okay. Other than the installation. The installation is a pain. <laughs> And that's because the Py package actually kind of runs like Python, and it says this. Um, I, I added this label in the sense that it makes you start with a blank model and then do stuff, which is kind of the, the step, system of steps for Python. In R, we just kind of run functions. Python, it's like load this model as a function and then do some stuff to it. It's a more common procedure. So we're going to first set a parameter, set of parameters for the tagger telling it I want to do you know, French in the universal part of speech. Then I say here's a sentence, start tagging. And the output is a data frame that adds part of speech as a column. So here's my example. I'm going to take the RDR model. I'm going to say give it to me in English and just annotate with the distinct parts of speech. So this is going to give me, I think, the tree bank set. Then the function is RDR part of speech. You put in the tagger that you made up here. And X here is our sentence that we've been working with this whole time. Okay. So we cannot, nor would we fire, uh, we're still getting fire wrong. Okay. So this embedded clause is causing us some issues on getting that one correct, for sure. But it's really nice. I like this structure. This is, uh, if you're familiar with Tidyverse, this is long format where we have each document. If we gave it multiple um, multiple text inputs, like a, a column of data, it would have each document, each word within that document, and its tag. Okay. So this puts it as one word per line, which, if you do a big, big, big data set, can be a lot um, of lines. But I have found that in general, when I'm working in R, having things in long format is much easier because many, many functions want the data in long format. So for example, ggplot, if you're going to make a plot, not that you would make a plot of this, but if I was going to make a plot, it wants it in long format. Um, and then a lot of analyses that I kind of run tend to be in that structure. So I like that. In this case, that's a great question. So about cannot here, the word cannot. Um, I think in this case, it actually would be a modifier on the verb. Can is a very strange word. Um, much like could, would, and should. Those are modals. I don't know if can is a mo modal or not. Let's go with the full word here. I know it's a contraction. Okay, fine. So, ah, it is a modal. Okay, so there's a set of verbs that are called modals um, that don't tend to stand by themselves. So you could say, I would, but people will be like, you would what? Right, so you're almost expecting another verb there. Um, so modal verbs are, are what would, could, should, I suppose can as well. Um, 
Then there's causative verbs like has, um, made, be, and get that almost always require some other kind of verb. Um, and so it is technically that kind of verb. So yes. Grammar, yes, I agree. English is also dumb. <laughs> like 100% dumb. Uh, that, and see, that's interesting. It's also an interesting question. I think it's listed as a noun because noun is the last guess. So you'll see here at the end of the notes when we make our own tagger that, that the backup is always to guess a noun. Okay, because cannot, I don't think it's ever really technically a noun, but not and not is a weird one too. It's going to be an adjective in this case. Um, we can not, no, it would be an adverb. It's modifying the verb. It's an adverb. Um, so I don't think a contraction piece like we learned a couple weeks ago would catch cannot because it's technically not contracted, like there's no apostrophe. But that's an interesting question. Is that in the contraction square? How do we do contractions in R? I've already forgotten. See, how often I do this? Let's see. Back up, back up. Contraction key lexicon. There it is. Let's see. Here's my answer to your question. No. So it would capture can't, and then it would separate them out. So if you wanted to split cannot into two words, you would have to add that to your key. See, it almost it always looks for the apostrophe. In R, anyway. I don't totally know about contractions in Python. Um, so let's ask this question. The obvious, to me, next question is... Let's say I build an English model, something that cannot be done, and that thing it cannot. Is it? Or is it modifying B, according to dictionary? Okay. Uh, hmm. See, I would have said that was modifying B. Of course, B is modifying done, so let's try something real quick. Uh, okay, so let's try X equal. Let's try your sentence. Something. So I think maybe it's just got the word cannot as one giant word as a noun. So let me see if I separate it into two words. Let's see what happens. See, as a, the, the distinction here seems to be to me that as a single word, it thinks it's a noun, but as a separate set, it's coding it as what I would have guessed, which is a modal verb a, and an adverb. <clears throat> But these taggers aren't necessarily right, you know, we've seen it be wrong. Um, but this may be one of those weird little English things. <laughs> there, there are several of them. Um, so what was that other one? We cannot, nor would we... <clears throat> so if I separate it out, I get the more what I would have expected more, the modal and the, the verb, the adverb label. So I guess too here, some text normalization might be important. Now we don't tend to take out punctuation during normalization because punctuation is helpful for part of speech tagging. In this particular sentence, it's screwing us up. Um, But in general, we could decide, oh, no, it's the embedded clause itself that's screwing it up. Oh. This one's just wrong. Okay, good to know. 
um, what was I saying? Normally, you would want to do some normalization. Now, generally, part of speech taggers handle contractions. So, <clears throat> but not always. And that is why I think it's important. <laughs> Uh, important to think about which one you're using and then I say that and this one doesn't handle it well so I think that would be something you'd want to play around with and figure out the limitations to which tagger you're using and it looks like in this case this ripple down rules one I would say it's going to give you better answer if you separate that contraction and add cannot as one of your words to separate Yeah, it's just getting fire completely wrong. Now our other two taggers got fire right when we took out that clause from last week. <clears throat> Measure certainty. Uh, that is part of the underlying set of rules. So I think, and you'll see this here when we build our own in a second. If you don't know, the best guess is a noun because the most frequent type of word at least in most languages, is a noun. Um, however, what you can do is use the frequency of each version of part of speech as a probabilistic predictor. So we looked at um, fire last time, which is kind of a reminder. So the most probable part of speech for fire is definitely as a noun, okay? and the second most probable version of it is verb. Okay, we ignore the fact that those each have different um, polysemes, right? They have different meanings, um, but more likely to be noun than verb. So you, if you aren't sure, you would want to bias towards the one that's more likely. So yes, that the answer to your question is yes, but it probably depends on the word itself built into the model. Can I see that number? Probably not without building your own. And we'll do that exact kind of thing in, in a minute. <clears throat> okay, uh, as in now. So let's move on to Python. Um, now there are ways to build your own models in R. I just think they're really clunky. They don't run nearly as well. So we're gonna talk about Python's available options and then we'll talk about building your own now, if I were to build my own now, I would use Spacey. Uh, and what I would do is take the English Spacey language model and then modify that. So I would start with that base and do some modifications. But I'm trying to introduce the model building in Spacey kind of slowly because it's not super intuitive. Um, and I, it's unfortunate, I think, the way they kind of have some of it set up. Uh, it's not hard, it's just very different than a lot of other code we're gonna do. So this week we're going to talk about how to build part of speech taggers using NLTK. It's sort of the classic theory. Um, it still works pretty well. Um, and then as we go through the semester, we'll talk more and more about how do I modify a spacey model. Right, so by the end of the semester, you'll be able to build your own spacey models. Not that you probably have data, a whole lot of data to train them with. So to me, the biggest downfall of all of these types of models is they're really cool and you'd love to do your own, but finding a data set that allows you to do it yourself is the tricky part. And we'll see that in a minute. So NLTK as the classic NLP um, package in Python. It's, it's really great. It just hasn't kept up with everything that's going on in the world. So they, they didn't, haven't really updated it in a long time. It's not maintained. Uh, but I think if you if you search for natural language processing in Python, what you're going to find is a lot of stuff on NLTK. It's a, a package that was very popular for a long time. Um, whereas Stacy, Stacy, Spacy is now considered the state of the art package. Or at least they will tell you that. Um, Overall, neither of these rely on Java, which makes life a lot easier to set up. This is usually the section that gives us the most computer problems, troubles because of Java. In general, I know we need Java, and I know it's used in a lot of things, but it is a headache and a half, to be honest, um, getting it to work sometimes. 
So let's just look at NLTK. If, um, if I were ever in the need of a part of speech tagger, okay, there's a really cool one called clause that I don't really see how to implement it very well. But if I were to do this now on a normal data set, so meaning just kind of regular English in my case, or regular whatever, I would probably use spacey because then I could also create uh, my own models where they have some training data sets for at least part of speech tagging. Um, but if I didn't have the option for spacey, I'd probably try to use this because okay, it works really well. Um, so what do I got to do? Well, I got to import an LTK. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can um, word tokenize the sentence first. So the other thing about part of speech taggers is you're never quite sure which option it's going to take. So can it take a whole non-tokenized sentence? So just the sentence as one long character string? Can it take multiple character strings? Does it have to be tokenized first? So I think for me, like when I'm trying to figure out which one to use, I always have to start with like, what is the input necessary? Is it tokenized or not? And what kinds of quirks does it have? So um, <clears throat> do notice that here uh, in LTK split that word in half. And I, I think you could probably come up with a couple of use cases to test your different um, examples on based on what you're trying to tag. Okay. If I'm trying to tag regular speech, I want one that can handle contractions because that has a lot of contract. We use them constantly. Okay. Um, so anyways, so this is one reason why um, I like an LTK, although the other three packages in R are fairly consistent as well. Um, but, so I'm going to have it tokenize the sentence first, and then the function is dot part of speech tag, um, pos underscore tag, and then we do that on the tokens. And what we get back is a list, so you can do this on multiple tokenized sets, and we get back a list of tuples. So I don't think, well, I think we've briefly covered tuples, but we're going to try to introduce this concept more. So the square brackets here, and it keeps going all the way down here, okay, indicate that it's a list. Remember, a list is just like one big long set of objects. It's kind of like a vector in R. And it's a set of tuples. Tuples, remember, don't mean two. In this case, they are two, but they don't mean two. Tuples are a little immutable. It's a fancy part of a tuple. Um, little groupings is like the way I think of them. Little entries. Right. We'll also talk about dictionaries later, um, but not yet. So <clears throat> tuples are just little like groupings within that larger list. Uh, the tuples don't have to be the same size, and that's kind of how this match, matches the list idea in R, and they don't have to be of the same type either. Um, in our case, what we end up with is pairs. So we have a list of pairs. By structuring it in this format, that allows us to do some cool looping, and we could put this into pandas uh, as a data frame. Um, yes, tuples spelled that way, T-U-P-L-E-S. Is that what you're asking? Is how it was spelled? I don't know what that was just then. Let me turn on. Not disturbed. No. Well, maybe like records, but not like words. Tuples are, are a, a Python oddity. <laughs> so a collection is the word they're using. Record is a good word, though. Okay. Um, they're ordered, and the, the bolded part is the, the big part here. They're unchangeable. Okay. Um, immutable is the word you'll see more often which means that I can't go in, like in R, I can go in and change row one, column two. I cannot do that here. So I can't say, oh, this one's wrong, change the second one. So we shouldn't be a pronoun, it should be, um, should be a special fancy word that I just made up, right? It should be a noun. I can't tell it to change that spot. Uh, that's a, there's a lot of reasons why that happens. Some of it is like saving 
uh, like efficiency. You can read a lot more about this. Um, if I were to try to work with this, the having them in these little pairs allows me to loop over them easier. And you'll see some example loops here in a minute. Um, the other thing you can do with these structured tuples is convert them into pandas, which is then I think you can then you can start playing with them. Right. And the cool thing about pandas, though, is that you can put a tuple in a cell. So you can actually have lists or tuples or dictionaries in cells, unlike an R, which allows, you know, kind of forces you to keep your your columns in order. Right. Um, so that way Python is a little bit more flexible. That can cause you problems, though, if you don't know what's in your cells. <clears throat> oh, I have a whole slide. I've forgotten this. So we've talked mostly about lists to vectors. Um, so you can tell it's a list by looking for the square brackets. Okay. Lists are handy. They're iterable, usually, which means you can loop over them. They iterate. Okay. Um, we can pick out objects, change the whole object by using slicing, but for tuples, I can't change the interior. So I could overwrite all of slot zero here. Um, but I could not change slot zero position one, right? so I couldn't change this. Um, your question. You can have a list and a column and a table. Oh, I don't work with tables a whole lot. Table is a dirty word in this house. <laughs> My husband has no idea what a table is. It, um, but like, generally, I would say if I had a complaint about tidyverse, <laughs> it is tables. Because mm, lots of functions don't work well with them. And um, the error message that you get isn't, okay, darn it, this is a tibble. I don't like those. It's like some other random message that you have, it takes you a while to get back to that point. Like, for example, you can't put tibbles in the reshape. Gives you an error. Same person wrote both of those. I know, spread, gather, long, pivot, wide, whatever, but um, <clears throat> they, they can cause you problems. Now, I think, like, structurally and, like, while we're off topic here, <laughs> I think structurally and um, data dictionary-wise, like, explaining what kinds of data you have, they're really nice. But then when I try to use them in other things that I really need to work, it can cause new issues. So, you know. Yeah, pivot longer and wider give me a headache. So that's so easy to use. Mm, no, no. <laughs> but that's my personal opinion on those. Uh, I'm not gonna start a tidyverse fight. I'm like, I want code, good code to me. Good code is code that runs and does what you think it does. Don't care if it's in tidyverse or not. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, back to tuples though. Tuples are immutable, and you can tell it's a tuple by looking for the parentheses. So, uh, from NLTK and then also from Spacey, what we're going to get back is a list of tuples, which is handy because those are easy to iterate or to loop over, and they're also efficient storage-wise. So, as you can imagine, large corpora take up a lot of space, so having an efficient storage system is useful. All right, note, even though this is day two of the lecture, we've already loaded Spacey and loaded the language module. So if you're ever like working, you get like NLP is not defined or some error like that, it's because you forgot to load it. So we loaded it many, many moons ago in this quick example section. Right? You have to, well, you don't need pandas, but you have to import Spacey and load the model first. <clears throat> Come on now. Um, we also did this a little bit differently earlier, so I wanted to show you the loop options here, but uh, at the beginning of the lecture notes, I showed you an example for pandas. Okay. Uh, I like the pandas way because I like structured data frames. I think they just like kind of make sense to me, being somebody who's worked with uh, tables and data sets for a long time. Um, but having them in this list format is also useful because we can loop over that or perform some other function with it. So I can tag my sentence. This is the same sentence we've been working with, okay, um, by using NLP, which is the loaded English module from earlier. 
can loop over each word in my sentence. And so the spacey functions to get your information back are dot text. Dot text gives you the original word. Dot POS with an underscore at the end. That's the tricky piece here. I don't know why they did that, but they did. Um, gives you the uh, kind of expanded part of speech uh, that gets a little bit more detail. Okay. Dot tag is the pen. I'm pretty sure the pen tree bank tags. Okay. So we as a pronoun cannot here um, separate it out into a modal or an auxiliary verb. Sometimes it's called an adverb. Nor would we conjunction modal verb. Uh, pronoun gets fire wrong. So they all got fire wrong. Mostly because of this embedded clause. Okay. Uh, and then it keeps going. So uh, Spacey, when you run the NLP function, actually has a ton of underlying stuff. And we'll work through one chapter at a time and we'll show you like, oh, it also does named entity recognition. That's next. It does dependency parsing. That's the next week. So it like has um, the, the, the breadth of the things that it gives you is really cool. But if you're just wanting the word and its tag, this is an easy way to get it back out. Okay. The only reason I print this extra little piece, this POS one here, is that it is a little bit more expanded and can help you if you can't remember NNP as proper noun. This is prop in, that might help you remember. Let's look at training our own. And we're going to use a brown data set because I feel like everyone's rite of passage into being a text analytics person is working with the brown data set at least once because it's overused, but we'll use it. Okay. So we're going to start with the classics here in NLP. Okay? So it has what is considered a default option. So to get a default, we train our default tagger. And when you say train here, I'm using this word very loosely to mean the default option is noun, but it allows us to set up a default option. We'll look at the regular expression tagger uh, and kind of show you its limitations. Uh, the most popular ones would be the lookup tagger that allows you to say this word is this part of speech. That is just basically like a dictionary lookup, which we talked about at the very beginning of this lecture as useful, but maybe not the most um, accurate. The unigram tagger, which is probably the best type of tagging that one can do, or bigram tagging, and you can go up higher, but then you tend to not um, have enough data to support doing much more than two words at a time. So we'll try all of those. And then we'll build it into one giant tag system. Okay, so let's look at the default tagger. What the default tagger does is it just allows us to tag everything. If you don't know, guess this. Now, practically speaking, in English, if you don't know what a word is, it's probably a noun. Um, Overall, if I tag everything as a noun, that's not very useful, but it's a good backup option. Um, so this is what kind of happens in the on the last stage. So it looks most of these systems. What it does is it looks for context based arguments. Okay, so in context of the words around it, which might be a bigram or a trigram tagger then goes into unigram. Well, what is this word most likely going to be given what I know about this word? Then if you really still don't know, it might use a regular expression. So does it have an ing? Can I guess that it's a verb? And then last to be like, well, screw it. I've never seen this word. It's totally new to me. It's a noun because that's more than likely what is left over. So, um, these unseen words tend to be nouns because if we've trained a system on a very big data set, more, more than likely new words are nouns. All right, so we're gonna load the brown corpus. So from the corpus set, uh, load brown. There is a, um, a tagged tree bank corpus and a tagged Reuters corpus that you can also play with for this, but brown's definitely the most popular. 
we're going to build our blank, our tagger and give it a, a training, a set of rules. Um, this isn't really training like we use when we say, when we think machine learning, but the idea is that we've trained it, that everything's a noun. So the function here is nltk.default tagger, everything's a noun. I'm going to pick a set of words. Now, I am using the news category, but I mean, honestly, I could pick the whole Brown data set. Right? Um, so I'm just going to say, hey, let's just try uh, training it on the, or tagging it with the news category. And then I could tag. Okay. So I, this is just proof of concept. Look, it made everything a noun. So that's literally what it's doing underneath. Now with NLTK, dot tag is the actual function to tag. It is a dot train and a dot evaluate function. So we're going to use both of those to um, do a little bit of, of testing and training. So how good is that? So I'm going to grab the Brown tagged sentences. So I grabbed all of the sentences that are available in Brown. This is a million or more words, okay, which is not really a whole lot in the grand scheme of things. Um, but at the time when it came out, it was a lot. Um, so I'm going to grab all these words, and I'm going to say default tagger dot evaluate. Okay. I didn't have to do any training because the training was literally it's a noun. And if I evaluate my tagger of it's a noun against a known set, what I get is 13% correct. Considering there are 54 tags in the brown set, uh, that's not bad. <laughs> it's better than chance, which would be 1 out of 54. So, you know, it's, it's not great. I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to sell this to any company, but you know it's not bad for a random or basically a structured guess. But we can clearly get better than this, so let's talk about how to get better. Okay. Now, regular expression taggers to me are not the most useful. They would be handy for scenarios when you had very specific lexicon. So I might use a regular expression tagger, honestly, to capture all of the um, <clears throat> slang in a text. So like LOL, all the like abbreviation, what's the word for that? Textisms, right? Um, and use it to match those to some specific category that it doesn't normally have. Like what would I call that LOL? Is that a verb? It, should I just call it slang? Because it's technically verb. What is out? Out is a weird word. Um, well, it would be an adjective, right? So, or is an adverb because it's met on the uh, verb. It's one of these things, right? It's a whole phrase. So, would I tag that? Do I need to expand it first? So, I would use the regular expression tagger for these types of scenarios where I want them to leave them in place and give them a special new tag that doesn't exist currently in the tag set. Um, or a very specific lexicon where I knew that um, <clears throat> I had uh, specific words that it wouldn't normally see. I was going to let you type this. Yeah, so they're, they're words, but they're not, um, you know, they're not, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of here? They're not, where's words? <laughs> my brain just like, out uh, my ears just now. They're, they're words, but they're slang in such a way that's actually multiple words. So the question I think I've seen a lot of, of NLP people arguing over is, um, do we expand that and tag them as their own individual words, or do we tag them as their own separate category? Right. But they are defined. Well, they're defined in Merriam-Webster now. Like, but it's just an expansion. So is it slang? Is it a sentence? Like, um, yeah, you've hit an excellent point here. Where um, I had when I was teaching freshmen, I had this like freshman intro to like 
so it was like a linguistics class. It was so much fun because we would um, we would uh, write on the board and rank order what was the worst thing that you could text someone. Like, like what would be the like most pissed off text that you could send? And it almost always was like a list of OKs and ranking like how bad it was. So the single letter K for OK, when you're like talking to somebody and you're like really mad, just the single letter K was the worst thing that you could text. But if it was like OK, totally spelled out, that was like mom text, right? Or um, uh, OK, two letters was fine, periods was fine. But if you got into the single letter K, you were in trouble. <laughs> So your point here about LOL not meaning really like laughing out loud, it's kind of more like ha ha, I would say, um, then is, is interesting. Because that's the point is like, is it its own unique thing now? And I would say yes. Or should I treat it as a contraction effectively? Um, but that to me seems like the best scenario to use these regular expression taggers because they have a known searchable text set um, where uh, the traditional use for a regular expression tagger is actually to match to known conjugations. So another good scenario for this is a language that has very regular conjugations, which is not English, <laughs> but always conjugates past tense, present tense, that kind of thing in the same way. This would be very useful. <clears throat> okay, now that we've wandered off, let's wander back. Um, so, Esperanto. Ah, that's been a while since someone's mentioned Esperanto in class. That actually would be a great example. Um, but the the linguistic repertoire of Esperanto is not so large that you couldn't capture all of the words. Uh, and if you're not familiar, it's a made-up language that is supposed to be the easiest thing to learn because it's completely regularized and always conjugates, blah, blah, blah. Um, and people speak it. I don't remember how many it is, but it's not a, it's not a um, trivial number of people last time I checked. It's a good example. <laughs> OK, but back, <laughs> back on traffic here. Uh, so patterns. We're going to make a list of tuples now that you've seen these. The little R here at the front just means that it's a regular expression. Um, and this just says, hey, I'm going to use special characters that mean the regular expression and not the character itself. And what, what it would do is find these in order. So if I had any number of letters and then ing, it would become a gerund. Any number of letters ed, so this is particularly problematic because there's a lot of English words in ed that have nothing to do with verbs. ES would be third person present, but that actually doesn't catch or walks. Um, would, would, could, should, or modals. Apostrophe S yes, or possessive noun. Just ending in an S is a plural noun. Like this to me is very problematic. <laughs> like this would be bad, I think. Um, any kind of number is a number, and then everything else is a noun. So let's see how good that does. Almost 2 million people? Wow. Very cool. So apparently Esperanto is even bigger than I thought. There's a whole like community. It's like kind of like a gaming kind of thing. Like it's not like gaming, like games. Like, But I think of it as that kind of same kind of, like there's a Minecraft community. I think Esperanto has like the same kind of like cultural thing going on. Klingon. Yeah, or um, the Elvish language in Lord of the Rings. <clears throat> That's also very popular. Um, <clears throat> let's see how good this does. So I told it to learn those patterns. Okay. And then I just had it tag a couple of our words. And um, this is uh, from the brown corpus that we're tagging and not our original sentence anymore. But you know, I don't know that I think it's doing that great. Hey, we have not told it at all how to tag a determinant. Determinants are things the A of, they are the, uh, no, sorry, the A and. Okay. They're definitely the most frequently used words. Okay. They're not the most frequent category, but the most frequent words. Um, or any prepositions. The prepositions are also very popular. So we're going to miss a lot of that kind of stuff. 
so if we evaluate that, we've moved up from 13 to 19, though. So, you know, it's not the worst thing ever, but it's not the best thing ever either. I'm trying to figure out if my better half got us food or not. I assume since he hasn't called, there is food. <laughs> um, all right. <clears throat> I thought that was who was texting me, but it turns out it's my dad. So let's move on to the lookup tagger. So <clears throat> word frequency is super important. It's one of the most useful pieces of knowledge that you can have. And it will be very easy for us to build a dictionary based on word frequency. D is a determinant. Pretty much doesn't change categories. Of is a preposition. Great. So we can make this list of words and their most frequent tags. So when you were asking earlier about, you know, is it 75% likely to be a noun, etc. This is one way to do that. <clears throat> the um, systems that use unigram tagging do this very similarly and then the more complex the system the more complex the underlying probability scenarios are and that's when they can start to use context we'll get to that in a minute um so let's say i just want like normally i would calculate this across all the words that i have but to show you proof of concept of like how much better this is than just guessing Let's just look at the 100 most frequent words and store their most likely tag. So like V is a determinant, of is a preposition, cat is a noun. Um, and see how much better I get with the 100 most frequent words in English. Uh, frequent meaning 100 most frequent words in the Brown data set. All right, so to do that, I'm going to use this function called FD, uh, freak, freak dist, freak dist. All that does is, is it makes a table. It makes a table of the tag by the word. And so I told it to print out here a conditional frequency distribution okay, is the tag by the word. Frequency distribution is just literally the table function in R. Okay. So give me a count of every word. Okay. And I've pulled here the top 100 words. So most common, sorts them numerically from largest to smallest and picks the top 100 because I wrote 100 in there. A conditional frequency distribution is a distribution of the word here by its tag. And um, what that would allow us to do is for each word in the 100 most common words, pick the most likely tag. So V is pretty much always a determinant, which here is labeled as an article, but sometimes it's labeled as a special type of article. So words can have multiple tags. The word that is uh, probably, depends on who you talk to, but probably the word in the English language that can be the most tags. It can be almost any type of part of speech. That is a very strange word but I don't want to get much more off topic than we've already been tonight. So we'll save the, my rant on the word that for a different day. Um, so now that I have that information stored, what I'm going to do here is say, you know what, create myself a dictionary. So I'm going to talk very briefly about dictionaries. Dictionaries in Python are denoted by uh, curly brackets. So this is the one above the square bracket on a normal QWERTY keyboard. Um, so like shift square bracket. <clears throat> and then what they consist of is just like a regular dictionary or a phone book. So it has a, t a key and a value. The key has to be like a single object. The value can be a whole list if you want. But what we're doing here is making it uh, a single object. So what we've got is effectively a key, the word that, and the most likely tag for that, which I don't even know what it is. Um, but I know of is going to be a preposition. <laughs> the is going to be an article. And so it's literally just a key value pair. If this, then that. Okay, so if the, then article. If of, then preposition. If cat, then no. So to create dictionaries, okay, we've got the, we've got it, it's a function, uh, dict here. And we'll use dictionaries more later. But what it's saying is this is the key and this is the value. Okay, so for each word, 
in our tuples, when we've got a, like a list of tuples, take the word and its most likely tag. So our CFD is this thing here, and it just picks which row is the most likely. So it's a, this is kind of which max in, in R, um, which one is the most maximum, has the largest value. Some of these are NAN because they're zero. And so what I end up with is a dictionary, a list of each word, um, and it's most likely um, part of speech just for the top 100 words. So here's what we're going to build. It's a unigram tagger, which we'll also use again in a minute, where the model here is not trained. It's just said, here's a lookup. Then I also allow the backup tagger so it doesn't um, uh, give us an error message. So mostly when you work with a unigram tagger function, you have to have some sort of back off or it will blow up. It won't run. Because if it runs into a word it's never seen, it will quit and give you an error. So we're just going to say, you know what, if you've never seen it before, guess now. Okay, so this is a stack, a ripple down set of rules. That's not the way that RDR works, but it's the same idea. And look how high we jumped when we evaluate. So by guessing the 100 most words, this is not the whole data set. This is not even all the words. So just 100 of the most frequent words in English, we went from 19% to 60%. So that tells you how much we repeat the same words over and over again. So cool. Let's see if we can do better than that, because clearly Spacey says they're getting 95% right, so clearly we can do better. <laughs> and let's look at the unigram tagger. Okay, to me, this is one of the most powerful functions that an LTK has. And the way it works um, is it often will pick the most common part of speech for a word, but instead of doing all of that word lookup dictionary stuff, instead what you can do is just tell it to train on a data set. So here's this data set. You figure it out. I'm not going to do all the work, and then pick the most common part of speech. It's called the unigram tagger because it works one word at a time. Okay. Um, whereas a bigram tagger works on pairs of words at a time. So in example, the word frequent is assigned to be an adjective even though it can be a noun. Okay. And the word fire from our example earlier gets assigned to be a noun because it's the most likely part of speech. But it uses the frequencies within the data to determine that. So this uh, your, your model is only as good as your training data, is what I'm saying. Uh, so it works a lot like a lookup tagger, but it allows us to do some training. And then we could add the lookup tagger for special words that we know we want to be tagged a certain new and fancy way, that kind of thing. Um, and what it does is the same thing we did with this lookup tagger, but now it's a little bit more efficient. So let's look at this. So all I had to do was I have you have to have some sort of tagged sentences for this function to work, as far as I understand it. Um, so the the type of input here is important. So you can't always use like the NPS chat data is really cool because it's got tagged um, uh, like posts from different Usenet places that would be really good data set for uh, slang and stuff but for these functions to work it looks like you have to input sentences. Okay. So we put in Brown's tagged sentences. This is why a lot of people like it as a training corpus is because it's already set up to be the, in the right format. Uh, blah blah blah. Where am I going with this? Right, unigram tagger. So I just told it to just to do it itself instead of me having to go through all those steps. And I told it to tag some words for me so I can look at them. Well, considering that I trained it on these words and then asked it to tag them, I would hope it would get them right. So one thing here is I'm cheating. We haven't gotten a whole lot into training data sets and testing data sets, which we will get to. But I really probably shouldn't train it on the same data that I'm going to test it on. Because that, hopefully we would get it right, right? You've seen it before. Um, but we do improve to 92%. And so what we really should do is split this data set up, right? So do um, 
half, you know, 80% of it is training, 20% of it is test. Uh, that wasn't the point of this lecture, though. I just want to show you that you can build a tagger that does do pretty good. If you do testing and training, if you split it up, you end up with hovering around 89%. So we're still pretty good. It's not terrible. It doesn't drop exponentially. Um, and that's the first tracker tagger we've really done that trains. All the rest of them are rule-based. Um, we shouldn't train and test on the same data. That's cheating. Often people do a 90-10 split or an 80-20 split. I've seen different numbers. I think this depends on the size of the data set. Um, if the data is weird, weirdly unique, you want to put <clears throat> more of it in the training data um, because you need it to see more of the options. Uh, in English, not so much. Weirdly unique. Uh, but you need a back off in case it runs into a word it's never seen, which is always likely. If you build a training model, or if you build a part of speech model, there will always be things that it has never seen that are infrequent or new. So you always need kind of a back off system. How much data is required? That is a great question. The more, the better. Um, I think the one that Spacey's on is like 50 million. Let's look. Because even though we're way off topic, a lot of the class we have not, um, we're good on time. So core models, blah, blah, blah. English, blah, 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 blah. I was trying to see how much data there, uh, stuff have been trained on. Trained on onto notes. I don't know how big that is. So Spacey itself is a concurrent neural net model. We'll get to those kind of at the end of the year. Let's see if I click on this, it will tell me how big it is. Doesn't seem to say blah, blah, blah. Ah, here we go. Okay. So this is how many words this has. Um, it's kind of partially looks like pin tree bank a little bit underneath. You'd, you'd be surprised once you start to investigate a lot of these models, a lot of them are based on Penn's tree bank um, or collective works that work with the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, University of Colorado is actually also a big player in this and BYU. So there are some like places that have big linguistics groups that really shaped the face of a lot of this stuff. Um, but here's how many words this is. So this is, that's like a... 1.5 million, right? If I can math, it's kind of hard. Uh, which I would say is not a whole lot, surprisingly. Um, the bigger the data set, the better. But um, the issue here is that you need a data set that has the tags to do training. So you have to have what's called considered a gold standard data set. That's why people loved Brown for a long time, because it was there and it had been checked many times so people knew it was right. But I would say a data set from the 1960s does not fully capture English now. Right? So there are training data sets available. You just kind of have to search them down. Okay? And then not all of them are free. So that's another issue. So I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> uh, more is better. I, for part of speech tagging, I would say you need at least a million. There's there's a number out there somewhere, but I don't, I don't know if I know it. Mm. I don't think it takes very much training to figure out of as a preposition, but hitting all of the other words that we use pretty commonly. All right, so this is just a little mini example of how to split out data sets. There's a better function in scikit-learn called test train split, but you know, if you want to go old school simple stuff, you can just simply calculate how many tags you have. So I have, you know, X number of tag sentences. I'm going to do a 90-10 split. So I figured out where that point is by using the integer function. Okay. So length here tells me how many sentences I have. Um, give me 90% of that as a number. And then I just say, well, let's train it on the first 90% and test it on the second 10%. So now I'm not cheating. I'm doing training sentences and then test sentences, and I'm about 88%. 
most good taggers are around 90%. Okay. <clears throat> so, we're pretty close. We can get better if we combine them all together. Okay. So one way to kind of deal with this, what's sometimes called accuracy and coverage, um, normally we talk about speed, accuracy, trade-off, like the faster you go, the less accurate you are, but this is an accuracy coverage question. So how do I make sure I cover enough of the words and stay accurate? Um, we can have these rules, step-down rules. So in this particular case, I'm also using the bigram tagger. Okay. What the bigram tagger does is it takes pairs of words at a time. So it'll take the first two words and look at what their tags are, and then the next two words and look at what their tags are. So instead of having a dictionary that's individual word and tag, it actually looks at pairs and tags. So it's got the pair and the tags that it should have. That kind of system will help us capture the word fire and other words that have multiple meanings a lot better. And it'd be even better if we did more context. But as I go from one word to pairs, we lose a lot of the training data because pairs are less frequent than individual words. And so the more words that you add to your gram, your n-gram, the more context specific it becomes and the less training data you have. In a perfect world, we could use a lot of Google's n-gram data if it had tags, which doesn't, um, a lot of it doesn't. And honestly, uh, this is where a neural net model really shines, and we'll get to those at the end of the semester. Um, things like WordNet. And that's what Spacey has added that has made them better than a lot of other things. All right, so what I've got here is a system of steps where it's going to start with T2, because I'm going to use T2 at the end here. And T2 is like, if you have seen this pair before, use that. Okay? If you haven't seen that pair before, like, okay, well, what about the individual words? Have you seen this word before? If you have, use that. If you've never seen the word before in your life, it's probably known. And this like three-tiered system works pretty well. As you can see, we got up to 91% for this test train split. It's pretty good. We could also add some regular expressions in the middle here. Um, I don't know that the addition of those adds much to this kind of model. This is, this is about as good as one can do before we start switching to more complex predictive systems. All right, so Spacey overall provides trained models that I think capture part of speech. So, you know, unless you've got a like, fairly specific scenario, I would just take the Spacey's model as is, or take the data that Spacey has and train my own model. If it's a model that, um, if it's a language that you're wanting to add that they're not done with. Right. Um, you can train your own. It, like for, for Twitter, is kind of a good example, or specific chat data, or if your uh, business has a specific lexicon. Um, but I would probably start with Spacey's model and then modify it. And generally, the best kinds of models are neural nets right now. Now, <clears throat> by best, I mean we're adding a couple more percents correct. So we went from, what, 91% here with a, like, well, to me, is a corpus that isn't the best. And just training with three lines of code, we got 91% right. Um, I think Spacey's saying they're getting about 94% right. NER accuracy. Can I see part of speech accuracy? They also have a large data set that's supposed to be better. Oh, part of speech, 97% right. The one we're using is the small one. So they're getting up to 97%. So it might be worth that extra trouble, actually. If it was only 94%, I don't know. But 97 is pretty, pretty good. All right. <clears throat> ah, sorry. So you can learn a lot more about Spacey by using the link, which is the one I was just looking at. So let's summarize everything now. 
algorithm of CNN. Um, CNNs are convolutional neural net models. Um, so it's not really even an algorithm so much as it is like a whole framework. So convolutional neural nets are meant to mimic the way that neurons work. And we won't get into totally into CNNs. We're going to do a simple neural net model called WordNet. Um, or as a convolutional model has some like extra stuff going on in it, but we'll get into like the basics of that. In my other class I do sort of briefly also cover those kinds of models and I have the notes that I can send you. If you want to send me an email, I will forward you those notes that explain how those models work. Um, I personally think RNNs are super interesting, but that's different story recurrent neural net models all right i can also send you some links of very good explainers like the dummies guide to cnn all right um so overall in this section what we covered was part of speech tagging and part of speech tagging allows us to do everything else in the semester except maybe sentiment um but it's kind of a necessary evil uh, so we talked about how to do this in R, we kind of looked at the limitations of that, we talked about uh, NLTK's base tagger and Spacey's base tagger, followed by building our own using NLTK. Okay. Now we could build our own with Spacey as well, but we're going to save kind of Spacey building models starting next week. Because okay. I just don't know if I could do much better than what they're already doing. Um, now. Using these skills, we can start to answer more interesting questions so like named entity recognition, that'll be next week, and dependency parsing. And those are more of the types of things that I might be interested in doing for an analytics project. 